Hello. Hi, Costa. Good morning. Hi, Richard. Thanks for uh, joining us. Welcome. Hey, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, Jeff, uh, great to have you. Thanks for joining. I I see Costa's on. Uh, we may have one other gentleman joining us. Costa, I think Chris had invited one of his clients. So um, if you wouldn't mind just waiting a minute. That's all right. Um... I'll, I'll give one more minute and then we'll kick off. Um, I don't have a ton of time today. I've got some stuff with Brandon and Mitch and uh, Hall in Michigan. So um, I, I can't do an extended Q and a, so I'll probably just do a real short, short background and then, uh, and then get into Q and a quickly. Great. Well, and hopefully uh, Jeff and Richard, you'll get to meet. Um, cost at some point i was i was in baltimore last uh, well hanover last week we had our uh december discovery day we we i think we had one of our largest groups that, yeah if you uh, include the virtual attendees it was definitely a a large mm -hmm. large group yeah i think we had 10 um 10 participants from around the country orlando austin um with two big places uh, where uh, people are moving. Yep. All right, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna kick okay kick things off, and uh, they can if they join after they can uh, view one of the older ones. But uh, thank you guys, Richard Jeff for jumping on the call. We've been doing this weekly call for over a year now, and it's kind of an introductory call to the model and what we're trying to do. So. Um, you know, if I were to sum up what we're trying to do into its most simplistic form is create an oil change only model, uh, that still has the upside of the old quick lube model. And what we've done is basically gone back to the original quick lube model that scaled the industry in the first place. We really do believe that at the end of the day, the consumer wants an oil change only uh, service. And so everything we do revolves around that one core thought. Um, and so we took a step back, we looked at all the things that the consumer was looking for in this service as oil changes are the number one uh, maintenance that vehicles require. And it's the number one recurring maintenance that vehicles require. And so it's a quasi utility in the sense that, you know, every car on the road, except for uh, Tesla's require oil changes and the consumer base of those that need it is extremely high and the consumer base of people who want it done for them is increasing uh, at a rapid pace and so whereas your your parents and their parents might have been more uh, inclined to do some of this stuff themselves they might have been more handy and, and done their own oil changes each generation is less and less wanting to do those kind of things themselves and so our model really lends itself to the direction that <clears throat> all service businesses are going. Um, it really starts with getting that overhead down, creating a proprietary flow chart for how to uh, get our uh, guys to be able to do the same unit economics with a, a fraction of the staff. <clears throat> and then also a commitment to quality oil, but not needing a brand tied to the business model to to pull people in. We, we really have a thesis that the average quick loop consumer does not care about brand. And so that allows us to have that little bit of extra margin that other companies don't have because they have that marketing expense built into their product, whether they're selling mobile one or pens oil or whatever product it is that has an inflated cost due to the marketing side of things. Um, we, we started with one location in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania kind of tested the model and saw growth relatively quickly. We opened a, a second location in Dillsburg, Pennsylvania, which is a town of 6,000 people. Again, saw success with the model, saw that it was what the consumer really wanted. Um, after we got to 10 locations, we felt as though we had something special going on. So we started the process of looking into franchising. 
And uh, we teamed up with Fran Devco, who has some experienced people in the automotive space that had seen brands go from emerging to national brands. And that was interesting to us. So we, we pursued that. Uh, the model resonates. We've had a lot of success over the last year and a half. We sold over 130 franchise territories uh, to about 50 franchise individual franchisees. And uh, we've begun the process of opening several stores, whether through conversions or new construction. Um, we're, we've, we've created a model that uh, is a little bit more affordable to the everyday investor, as opposed to needing high net worth and liquidity requirements that some of the older brands require in order to get into the quick loop space. So it's a much more accessible option and, uh, and, and we've seen success in that. So, um, that's the super high, uh, high level, uh, version of what we typically do. We post these videos on our YouTube channel. So I've given my personal background a, a hundred times, uh, feel free. If you do want to hear about that, we, you can pick any of the number of videos posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and then the Q and a is really the best part because I feel as though the people who come on here come from a diversity of backgrounds and ideas and opinions. And so it always leads to a, a good exercise of, uh, of, of Q and a. So I'll let Michael curate the questions and we can go. Uh, I, I would like to go as short as possible, but obviously if you have burning questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, Costa, um, Richard, uh, nice to see you in an office, Sammy. You're not having to work out of your car today. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. It's finally back. Yeah. Do you I, have I a think, question? I, I do. do I, I, I just think for me, you know, the, the, the biggest question that I have is I haven't really done uh, a lot of research into the uh, proliferation of the electric uh, car, right? Uh, if we're if we're going to be required to sign a 15 year contract, uh, what is the the, the long term effect of the electric car uh, or the move to electric vehicles? Uh, how is that going to affect uh, uh, the cost of oil uh, uh, concept? Yeah, that's I mean, that's obviously a question that comes up with every automotive repair brand in the country right now is how are we going to be best positioned for when electric vehicles are more significant than what they are right now? And Everyone's got a myriad of opinions. Everyone's got a myriad of ideas, but really the market can change on a dime. We just got that news about the nuclear fission that uh, that that we were able to do the other day and uh, unlimited energy, unlimited no cost energy could be a huge game changer. So technology is always changing. But what I will say is there's you know over 300 million uh, internal combustion engine vehicles on the road right now. 4% of registered vehicles are electric at the moment. Um, there are definitely industries that are built upon consumer bases smaller than even if half of the cars were to become electric. And at the current state of our infrastructure, if even 14% of cars on the road became electric, we would have weekly, uh, we would have weekly energy blackouts across the country because the way that people think that charging is going to be versus what it will really be it are two different things you know there's a lot of people that advocate for turning these corner corner neighborhood gas stations into charging stations but that's just not a realistic picture of how these cars are going to be charged you know the same way that when we go to bed at night we plug in our phone you know we're going to be plugging in our cars and that's going to be a huge strain on the grid and the Build Back Better infrastructure plan did have provisions for improving that infrastructure, but you know we're we're still working on the infrastructure omnibus bill from back when Obama was president, and so these things move very slowly. Um, I think some of the even the most aggressive EV proponents don't place a uh, turning of the majority until after 2035. Um, and, and that's like the biggest advocates. So a lot of stuff does have to happen first, but I don't want to rely on kind of the negative stuff to make my case. I would much rather talk about the positive stuff for us. So, you know, we are well positioned to be profitable with lower car counts. We are well positioned to have less overhead and we are also well positioned to be the service that the consumer wants. And so if we can get to a national scale and be known as the oil change only option 
while some of the competitors in their massive $1.5 million buildings are doing all of these other services that they had never done before. You know, do you really want someone like Jiffy Lube or Take 5 doing, uh, you know, an engine swap? Do you want them tinkering with your transmission? Do you want them doing some of these higher skilled required services? And then you have this see this abundance of different brands all doing the same thing. You know, if we can stand out as that oil change only option, even though the market cap for internal combustion engine vehicles might go down right, in terms of raw business. numbers, the amount of people who are needing the oil change for us, that market cap could go up. And so I think that it's not necessarily uh, impossible for us to continue to grow even as electric vehicles, you know, penetrate more. And then lastly, I'll say at the current moment in time, and this is, you know, more of a, a tactical answer to your question. The, the amount of people entering the do it for me marketplace outpaces the amount of people buying electric vehicles at right now. So what that means is as people become driving age in the United States, and, you know, put the electric vehicle aside for a moment, you know, we don't have any public transportation that's worth anything at the moment. And so people are going to continue to drive and teenagers are going to continue to drive as they enter the marketplace. And you look at the Gen Z, Gen Y, whatever you want to call these different generations, <clears throat> they're not going to be getting on their, on their backs and doing all changes in their driveway. Like, you know, our parents might have, or some of the older generations that were more, um, industrious. And so that, that market space, we are actually in a, in a state of growth right now. Um, and so I foresee that for quite some time, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Um, oh, uh, Jeff, um, do you have a question? You know, the only thing I have, Mike, is really what we, we discussed some yesterday and that's, uh, you know, as, as, Costa continues to scale. Um, how do you, well, until you really reach that level, um, how are you keeping, um, especially the uh, the transportation of um, a product? How, how are you keeping those costs down to the franchisees? Um, just my experience with the current franchisors that I deal with, um, that that it it, it certainly. Um, cost prohibitive to some growth because of that. And uh, I just want to make sure that it's a level playing field for the franchisees and that we can all keep costs down, um, you know, as, as we enter, potentially enter this business. Um, yeah, I'm just inter interested in your thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point, Jeff. Everybody in our industry has <clears throat> the same main cogs, which is your bulk oil and your oil filters. So those are your two main cogs. We really have three cogs which is uh, bulk oil and filters, and then your ancillary products, which are like your wiper blades, air, uh, air filters, additives, things like that. So oil filters and uh, bulk oil take up the vast majority of your product. Now we have two things going for us. I've developed relationships with large distributors that have nationwide reach that have promised to give our franchisees the um, same pricing that corporate has. And so almost in the form of a co-op, our franchisees day one have the same pricing that we have for oil and filters. Um, we don't have any rebate system. We don't have any markup. We're not getting a piece of any of that. It was very important for me that the franchisees have the same cost as us. So the third parties that we deal with do provide that infrastructure so that we're not sending product to someone in Texas product from Hanover, Pennsylvania, from our warehouse, unless it's like a premium product or a private label product or cost of branded product. Um, secondly, because we don't believe in brand as a moving the needle type factor for this business, when we have a price increase on our cogs, it's not nearly as affected as some of the other brands that might be using some of the name brands. <clears throat> you know, mobile one is not just eating their sponsorship to Red Bull and Formula One. That hundred plus million dollars is going back into every packaged product they sell. And the same goes for their NASCAR sponsorships. The same goes for all their commercials. And so when you have a branded product, you're paying those marketing expenses and where our oil might be six to $8 a gallon, 
uh, for our oil that might be 10 to 15 to even $20 a gallon for someone using a name brand. And, um, and that goes for every aspect of our business from the building itself to the, the materials. If we're starting from a much lower point of entry, but we have the same unit, unit economics and the same price points, then, you know, we're not as imp impacted when building costs go up 30%, 30% on a million dollar building, you know, is a lot more than 30% on a $300,000 building. So we think that we're uh, positioned well for, for that as well. Great. Thanks, Costa. I know Jeff had brought that up to me yesterday and I, I had uh, shared the same information that, so it's good to do a, a check on that. I, I would just add in, you know, if you're doing, you know, two, 300 cars a week, the savings that you can get accrue on the main supplies, like Costa mentioned, the uh, lubricants, uh, the oil and all of the filters, you know, adds up to um, a substantial amount of money that you can drop to the bottom line. And, so. and, and we're a very lean operation. So we are, and we're also very data driven. So we're going to put the SKUs that move the fastest on the shelves. We're not going to have dead inventory. We're not going to have large upfront costs to carry every single type of oil under the sun. We're going to get the large purchases for the things that we know are going to turn over quickly. This improves your cash flow. It improves your 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 ability to service the maximum amount of people without having to overpay to cater to the lowest common denominator. Right, and I think more what I was referring to is that I, I, again, Michael alluded to this yesterday. That some of it is locally sourced. So there's no uh, additional shipping costs there or transportation costs, but those things that aren't um, is that going to hit me in Texas? differently than it would somebody in Pennsylvania. Well, uh, what would some of those things be? Like the only thing I can think offhand that that we're finding with our existing franchisees that are getting open is the different markets demand different wages. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, right. And that's that is one differentiator. But <clears throat> as far sure. as like the cost of goods, it, it's the same for everybody, regardless of where you are. Right. But the, the transportation of those costs and goods can be significant, especially in today's day and age. And, uh, you know, again, Michael, there's one of you, one of, one of the, I think the main supplier, you said that I don't have those notes sitting in front of me, so forgive me, but- uh, Petro Choice, I, I, I think it's the supplier of the oils and the lubricants. Right, the, so yep. they're, they're, they're local, but there's some, there's another one that you couldn't speak to because you, you weren't aware. And I can't, I, again, without my notes, I can't speak to it well, service So Service Champ is our main distributor of right. all- filters and additive products and as long as the order is over two hundred dollars they don't charge shipping at all right right okay and so if you know if done correctly there is no logistic cost to anything that we do and i assume that's probably 90 95 percent of your cogs anyway is that correct Correct. And then okay. what we what we backfill is a national account with AutoZone. So that's your local AutoZone that the, right. the pricing, you know, will will be different based on market. But we try not to use AutoZone if we don't have to, because between PetroChoice and ServiceChamp, we can order, you know, 99 percent of all the products that we need to run this business. OK. All right. That's fair. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Costa. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jeff. Um, Mark, thank you for joining us. I, I believe you're working with Chris uh, Longmore. He mentioned that you may be on the call. We, uh, we're just doing a round robin right now for uh, questions. Uh, if you made it on the call enough to hear a little bit of what Costa shared, if you want to ask him a question, please go ahead. I don't have any questions at this time. I just wanted to jump on and listen to you guys a little bit and if you guys continue i may have a question later but thank you okay thanks for joining us um richard uh i i guess uh we probably have nine minutes at most before uh we end the call uh, another question uh, yeah just real quick um <clears throat> pardon me on the um uh, obviously the, the 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 cost of entry is is quite a bit lower but what i'm I would like to know is 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 what is the the strategy for development? In other words, uh, I know that you look for ground leases. You have a one and two bay option. Uh, can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Uh, how how you approach finding the, the the land to develop? 
and then and then actually developing that property and and what is the typical timeline and expense associated with that so we have multiple ways of getting open we we try to be as practical as and pragmatic as possible when it comes to this part of the process because it's the biggest hang up in our entire industry um, I mean, there are grease monkey franchisees that have been in the system for three plus years that haven't even put a stake in the ground to start beginning their, their building. Um, so every, everyone's kind of going through the same thing. They are also competing for traditional half acre lots, which we typically are able to put our building on much smaller lots that are not as coveted by, you know, so if you're, if you're searching for a half acre out parcel, you're not just competing, you know, Jiffy Lube versus Grease Monkey versus Speedy versus you know, Valvoline, you're competing with Popeyes and Starbucks and people who are willing to pay enormous ground leases. So we have the real estate advantage of trying to take up space that other people are not looking at, or it's space that the landlord and the landowner uh, just had already written off and are looking to make extra revenue on it. And we've seen other models like uh, ice vending machines and you know a lot of brands are creating kiosk versions of their business to do some of these out parcel activity and parking lot activity so that's for the new construction and we use a third party uh, broker a master broker uh, Morrow Hill that does all of the site search assistance now at the end of the day site selection is on the franchisee the I mean, really in the history of franchising, the only brand that has been successful at mandating where your real estate is has been McDonald's and they're McDonald's. So they can, if they tell you you're going to, uh, you're going to be somewhere, then you're going to be there. Um, so we are not unlike other brands where at the end of the day, the onus falls on the franchisee. And what we have found is those who have put in the effort, it's reciprocated through the processes and tools that we help with um now commercial real estate is largely uh dictated by county level government and so you have to rub elbows with those county level employees to get things done and they may ask for what you think are arbitrary things but you have to play the game to get them going and so right now you're looking at between nine and 16 months from the time of sourcing the site to getting the permit to be able to excavate. We've come up with a few different ways to get open faster and it includes conversion of existing quick loops, but we've also uh, un unveiled a car wash conversion model as well. That helps get uh, franchisees open faster as well. So um, in terms of what we're doing versus some of the other emerging oil change brands and where we are versus where they were at the same time, we're much further ahead in getting units actually open. Um, and then at some point we'll, we'll find a strategic partner that has the resources to really accelerate that growth. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jeff, any other questions at, at this point? No, actually Richard just hit on the uh, same question I had. So thank you. Okay. Costa, um, I, if you've got five minutes, you know, early on, um, you mentioned your first location in Harrisburg. I, I think uh, that story about taking over that location and what you did in a, in such a short period of time would be, I think, really fun for the attendees to hear. Do you, do you have five minutes to share that? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, um, you know, it, it it's a fun story in the sense of how it ended up working out. I, I come from a background in finance and I have a master's of science in finance and an MBA. And I was working at T. Rowe Price and had a really nice job and a nice salary. And um, But I'd always wanted my own business. So I looked for businesses that I felt were manager centric and something that could run while I was still having my full-time job. And the oil change space does provide that because on the day that the manager has off, there's continuity of the store. The other employees can run the store and it's not a, you know, the day to day of a quick loop business is not difficult at all. And so uh, there was a, there was an older couple in Harrisburg that had basically, you know, shut, shut down growth, shut down effort in the store and the numbers were really trailing. And I offered to take over the business for, not a lot of money. I spent a ton of time on, at the time, Yelp, kind of reverse engineering the reviews and figuring out what I thought was the best uh, model for our space. 
I felt like Jiffy Lube had created some credibility issues in our industry and that by providing, you know, kind of the bare minimum of service uh, that you could exceed expectations. And so I was able to implement that in that first store and people responded to it really well. Um, and then it turned into what it is right now. And it's been a lot of fun um, and, a, and a fun business to be a part of. So um, that's that's really it. Yeah, I, I think the uh, the magic there, though, was just cutting services and, you know, offering a friendly, transparent service at, at a reasonable price. And you now have, is it 16 corporate locations you've just opened up? Three? Uh, we will be at 20 by the end of January. End of January. Okay. Yeah. So um, anyway, well, thank you for sharing that. I, uh, I, I know we have... Um, Jeff and Richard, some uh, future calls scheduled. Jeff, I've still got a couple items I need to get to you. Um, and I, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, Chris will continue with his stuff. And uh, hopefully, you know, if this is a, a concept that interests you more, we have our discovery day coming up in January, the 18th, 19th. And uh, we've got an agenda set up already and I can send you details on that. So uh, hopefully... We'll meet you there in person. So, Costa, thank you for your time today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everybody, and uh, have a Merry Christmas. Yeah, thank you. Yes, likewise. Thank you. Okay.